All right, you crazy kids. Let's jump into entropy and Gibbs free energy. Entropy, variable s, is a measure of the degree of randomness of the particles in a system. Whenever you think about entropy, I want you to think about locating a particle. It's all about an individual particle. We have solids, we have liquids, we have gases. In a solid, we kind of know where those particles are located. They're just vibrating, right? No big deal. Liquids, the particles are still close. They're sliding past one another. I can kind of find out where the particles are. However, with gases, particles are moving rapidly. They can slide past one each other. They're not even near each other. So locating a particle is very difficult. What I'm kind of explaining to you is a general rule or general trend with entropy. From a solid to a liquid to a gas, entropy increases. If it's all about particles and locating them, when would it be zero? Or when would your individual particles be in an exact location? When would your entropy not be random? It would be not random at absolute zero. When things are at absolute zero, they stop moving, all right? That's the idea anyway. And if it's not moving, I can, I can you know, figure out exactly where it is or get a very precise location. So that would be entropy zero. From that information, we should get that as energy increases, randomness increases, therefore entropy increases. We have a formula. I don't know if this is in your packet or not. I don't really know when you would actually need this, um, probably in college or in AP, but it's the entropy of your products minus the entropy of reactants. It's very similar to Hess's law, so not that difficult to memorize. In chemistry, when entropy increases, we give it a positive value, and when entropy decreases, we give it a negative value. And remember, the big thing about entropy is always about locating a particle. If you're, it's becoming more difficult to locate a particle, it's positive. It's less difficult to locate a particle, it's negative. Let's see if this makes sense. If we have some solid sugar, and we put it in some tea, and we get some sweet tea. Fantastic. Would S be positive or negative? Or your delta S be positive or negative? Is it becoming more difficult to locate the particle or easier to locate a particle? And I'm talking about any of these particles. If I combine them together, I mix them, it's becoming more difficult. If it's becoming more difficult to, difficult to locate it, it's a positive value. So delta S would be positive. Other things that would be a delta S positive would be anytime you mix anything. Um, if I have more moles of gas, or if I have solid to a liquid, or if I have more liquids present, um, these would all be a delta S that's positive. Gibbs free energy is a little bit more confusing. It's another calculation. This one's definitely in your packet. Here it is. And let's talk about what it actually means. Gibbs free energy, variable G, is really calculating whether or not things are thermodynamically favored. Thermodynamically favored is a very fun chemistry type way to say spontaneous. In life, or in nature, processes are driven towards the highest possible entropy, meaning they're more random, and the lowest possible enthalpy, meaning they don't have a lot of potential energy. They're more stable. Thermodynamically favored is when your delta G value is negative. When it's negative, the reaction is spontaneous, meaning it just happens without any outside force. It'll just naturally occur. If I put some zinc into acid, that delta G would be negative. It automatically reacts. I don't have to do anything to it. However, a match, a match doesn't ignite by itself, I have to drag it across that, you know, little sandpapery strip, and then it ignites. So that would be a non-spontaneous event. So Gibbs free energy, the calculation, we should see here that the variables are enthalpy, entropy, and temperature. All of that goes in. You're going to have three possible choices for an answer. Delta G is going to be less than zero, and when it's less than zero, it's a spontaneous event like this ball is automatically going to roll down the hill. It could be more than zero. It's a non-spontaneous event. This ball will not naturally just go up that hill. Or it's at zero. And when it's at zero, that's equilibrium. And what I mean by that is if I push this ball, it's going to go that way, but it's going to come back this way and go up that way, and it's going to go back this way and go that way, and goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's your forward versus your reverse reactions are equal. That's an equilibrium state. So let's look at this fun square I made. In nature, like I said, things are naturally going to have a negative enthalpy and a positive entropy. And if that's the case, 
We call that a spontaneous event. It naturally occurs. All right? Both of those things are favored. When you do a calculation where delta H is negative and delta S is positive, your delta G will naturally be negative. We could also have a different situation in which delta H is positive and delta S is negative. That means it's becoming less random and it's absorbing energy. That's a weird thing to say. That's a non-spontaneous event. That would be me like building a wall. It requires energy to build that wall and it's becoming less random. That doesn't just naturally occur. You have to force that wall to be built. I have to do it. Your other two stances here are you have one thing that's naturally favored and one thing that's not. If you have one thing that's naturally favored and one thing that's not, that means the system is now controlled by temperature. So one will only happen at high temperatures and one will only happen at low temperatures. The example here is melting and freezing. And that'll make more sense in a second. Let's take a look at melting and freezing. So melting, ice turns into water. In nature, that naturally occurs. That'll happen when, though? When does ice turn into water? Oh, that's at high temps. Let's see what that means. Ice to water, is it becoming more random or less random? Well, it's becoming more random. It's becoming more difficult to locate that particle. And let's think about our delta H. Is it require energy or does it give off energy? Well, those particles, which are moving very slow, are now moving pretty fast. If they're moving pretty fast, that means they've absorbed energy. If they absorb energy, that's positive. So let's see if that makes sense in terms of our delta G. We said that this would be, at high temperatures, delta G would be negative here. So positive and positive. Oh, here's my positive and positive, only at high temperatures. That's melting, that works out. Well, let's look at freezing. When does water naturally turn into ice? Oh, that's at low temperatures. Let's use green. That means this naturally occurs, or it's spontaneous, delta G is negative, when it's cold outside. For my delta S, is my entropy increasing or decreasing? Well, liquid to solid, that means it's becoming more organized. I have ice crystal that's becoming more organized. That means delta S should be negative, right? For enthalpy, does it require energy or does it get off energy? So water, once again, moving pretty fast. These particles have a lot of energy. And on this side, now they don't move very fast. That means they had to have given off that energy. So if things are moving fast and now they're moving slow, delta H would be negative. So negative and negative, we said that delta G would be negative at low temperatures. Let's take a look up here. Oh, negative, negative at low temperatures, like freezing, delta G is negative once again. So from this information, we're trying to figure out whether or not something is thermodynamically favored or whether or not it's spontaneous or not. Let's take a look at some examples. So here I'm giving you delta H, I'm giving you delta S. First thing I want is a potential energy diagram. You guys could try all these first if you wanted to pause. I'm going to work through these in the amount of time it takes me to work through them, I guess. So let's see. Potential energy diagram. I'm looking at delta H for a potential energy diagram. If this is negative, hmm, is that exothermic or endothermic? Okay, that means it's exothermic. That means my potential energy diagram would kind of look like this. My products would have less energy than my reactants and the difference here would be my delta H between my reactants and my products. I've already covered it's negative, and if it's negative, right, here, that means it's exothermic. Is entropy increasing or decreasing? All right, that, now I have to look at S for entropy. So it is a negative value. If it's negative, oh, what does that mean? It's becoming more organized. If it's becoming more organized, entropy decreases. And then asks us the question, is this thermodynamically favored at 25 degrees Celsius? This is when I have to plug it into delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. When I plug all those values in, and I welcome you to do that as well to make sure you get the concept of it, and realize that 
This is kilojoules and joules, so you're gonna have to convert because I'm so much fun. Delta G comes out to be negative nine nine two one joules per mole. Now, if it's negative, that means this is a spontaneous event, or yes, it is thermodynamically favored. Cool. Let's do the next one. So this time, oh boy, here, what do we have here? We have a formula, okay, we have a chemical reaction that we're observing, and then I gave you a heat of formation, and I gave you the entropy. Okay, so heat of formation is here, neat. Mm. First thing says, what is A? I mean, what is delta G? So delta G, I'm gonna have to calculate this, all right? That's gonna be my formula once again that I've just used before, nothing crazy there. We get our delta G is equal to our delta H minus T delta S. I gotta plug in all my values. Hmm, should I use positive 90 for delta H? No, no you should not. You should use positive 180. 0.74 kilojoules. Why? Oh, because this is heat of formation. I have two moles, so I have to multiply that value times two. And then subtracting this from my change in temperature, 298K. Got to use Kelvin, as always. Hopefully you did that on the first one. Times 0.0847 kilojoules per mole times Kelvin. Oh, I ran out of space. Oh, well. Uh, anyway. Answer for delta G comes out to be positive 155.4 kilojoules per mole. And then, that's my answer. Cool. If it's positive, this is a non-spontaneous event. This doesn't naturally occur. So I can answer this problem down here. Is this spontaneous? No. It's positive. Finally, does delta S make sense? Delta S is positive, and it's really close to zero. Huh. Is this becoming more random or less random? Supposedly, this is becoming more random because of the positive value shown there. Looking at it, I have two moles of gas and I have two moles of gas. I have individual things and I have one thing. Personally, I think this should be negative. I think this becomes more organized. But according to the data, this is actually becoming less organized as a positive value. It's becoming more random. I really don't know why. Uh, I can't say that's very, very close to zero, so your change in entropy is not drastic here. So hopefully that makes sense. Our last one. We have A, B reacting to make C, and it looks like this is endothermic. I have heat on the left side of my reaction. My question to you would be, what are some things I could do to increase my concentration of C? Oh boy, this is the throwback question to last unit. Well, not last unit, but previous lessons. So why don't you pause and try to think about things you could do to increase the concentration of C. All right, here are some answers. I could increase the temperature. If I increase the temperature, it would shift to the right. That would make more C. Another thing I could do, I could increase B. That would also do a shift to the right. I could... Increase A. That would also be a shift to the right. I could decrease C. That would also be a shift to the right. And the last thing, because I have a gas here, and I only put four dots, but there should really be a fifth here, is I could decrease the pressure. If it decreases the pressure, it would shift to the side that makes more pressure. That would be the right-hand side. It would shift to the right again. Boy, that was a fun problem that pulled back some memories from before. All right, that's your quick lecture on Gibbs free energy and entropy. Hopefully that makes sense. You'll have some problems to do. I wish you the best of luck. See you out there.